After receiving a lot of good feedback from part one, I got straight to work on gathering everything and anything I would need to make part two as best as it could be. So in this video, I plan to take the time to show all of you the little things I missed or want to talk about that I didn't mention in part one, as well as test to see if all the parts work, or at least most of them. It is going to be a crazy ride, and I hope we don't have to make a part three. Unless that's what you want. But anyways, without further ado, let's dive right into this, shall we? I will be taking this slow and steady by testing each of these parts one at a time, starting with the motherboard and CPU. I went on ahead and pulled my cheap $30 acrylic test bench out to mount them onto it. I don't want to rebuild this PC yet without knowing what works and what doesn't. Because of its previous state, I'm doing this to avoid a fire erupting in a box. Last thing I need is one bad part burning or destroying all of the good parts of this rig. Or my house. That's pretty important. This setup will be a little jank, but it will get the job done. First, I installed the RAM, CPU, and AIO. Oh, and the GPU. For the purpose of doing this correctly, I will be using the $10 GPU from the first video I ever uploaded so we can isolate any problems since the first GPU from the original build may not work as previously mentioned. Also, this same premise will be used for our power supply. After making sure everything was plugged in and powered up, we could short our pins and attempt to boot the PC. Ooh. That doesn't sound good at all. Yeah, you're telling me. Nothing is coming up. But at least we know it isn't the GPU. With the fans running at full throttle, I can imagine it is one of our components stopping the system from posting to the BIOS, from which it is running into an error or something. We can start troubleshooting by reseating our RAM and swapping the slot since it wasn't running in dual channel to begin with. And with that simple fix, it boots. Nice. And from here we can see that all of our components are running correctly too. Knowing that all the parts works means that we can move on to the next part, the GPU. Even though it might not work, we can at least put some fresh thermal paste on the IHS and see if it runs. I was going to replace the thermal pads for the RAM chips, but they were in bad condition, so they get to stay. Fortunately, it spins to life. I guess nothing was wrong with it. That's great. All I need to do is install some drivers and see how it does under load. At idle, it does fine with temperatures in the mid 30 degrees Celsius. And when it's playing games, it runs without crashing. Good. If we put it under load and run it at full throttle, it reaches around 76 degrees Celsius. It's pretty crazy, but not out of the ordinary. Oh, and its performance? Not bad for a GPU found on the side of the road. It's over 12 years old, so don't expect it to run AAA titles today. But hey, for a free GPU, it feels not too shabby considering how it was found. Also, before I forget, yes, the fans on the radiator are RGB. I know some of you guys really wondered if that worked or not. And they work fine. Anyways, back to the rest of the PC. A question probably being asked at this point is, what about our other parts, like our power supply? Well, I don't feel confident plugging it into the system, or any good system at this point in time. I will short the pins to see if it runs without exploding or shooting sparks everywhere. And with that, it spins to life with no issues at all. And I swore that it had to be the one part that would explode besides the GPU. This must mean every part works. Ah, not so fast. Some of these other parts may disappoint that assumption. Parts like the multimedia reader work for sure since there is no particular reason for that to break or stop working. But I just don't have a floppy disk to check if the floppy disk reader works as floppy disks have moving parts that can wear out. The fact it was in this build alone is strange enough and I'm currently too lazy to test the temp cage drive. Although, I will point out that it wasn't just for checking your CPU's temperature, as it was capable of checking GPU, hard drive, and CPU temperatures all at once. It would do this by using these sensors to read a heat source, which means you could attach them to anything really and create your own readings. Nowadays, we just use programs to really check the temperatures of any component in a computer. 
One of our last accessories, the light bar, remained a mystery until an IT friend of mine explained that it was a fluorescent tube that would interact with custom water-cooled rigs with the assistance of UV-coated water to create unique builds at the time. It predates RGB, which honestly makes it one of the coolest things about this rig. Unfortunately, while the camera struggles to pick this up, the tube is shattered. So unless I can find another one, there is nothing I can do in that regard. He also theorized that this is the second system built for this case, as the UV light would have been accompanied with a custom loop, which makes sense. But enough speculation. Let's get to the final piece of the puzzle, the case. Ignoring other parts and accessories like fans and the motherboard speaker, this case was designed with longevity in mind. The airflow of the case is spectacular, in fact, as the fans are placed near ducts that are part of the top shell on the top of the case. Remember, this case was made in a time when fans weren't normally located at the front of the case and usually relied on a single 80mm fan in the rear for ventilation. We also go above and beyond the top shell by also having vents on the bottom of the case with a mesh cover to which we can mount 100mm fans too. This allows for proper ventilation since the case is elevated due to its mobile design with its rolling wheels. But what I think is the most impressive thing about this case is its removable board bay. Yeah, that's right. A case that can be hypothetically transferred from frame to frame. The case even gives you markings for motherboard types, including the very uncommon EATX for its standoffs. It's like a server case. A home server case. Honestly, this case is like many things new and old. For how surprisingly high quality it is, it's a shame someone would leave it in the state it was in, let alone on the side of the road. Well. Let's get this thing assembled and screwed down so it can be reassembled to its former glory. Oh, fun fact. Everything can be mounted reverse upside down. I don't know the purpose of this or why I can do it, but hey, it's pretty cool at least. All right. All I have to do now is mount the AIO and radiator. Uh, I can't. Uh... Well, I guess we learned why it was never fully assembled on the side of the road. Great. I'm not sure how to continue this, or if I should continue this, but for now, I think that about does it. Such a unique PC. Too bad I will have to do something crazy to rebuild it if I make a part 3. What do you guys think? Should I rebuild it with a standard CPU cooler? Or put it in a separate case? Or something completely different? Or even call it quits here? Maybe repurpose the parts for a newer video. Let me know in the comments below. Subscribe if you haven't also. And most importantly, thanks for watching. Until then.